Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here. We pray. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Welcome to our thought for the day. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. Well, good morning and welcome to our service here in Great Island Presbyterian Church and it's great to have you with us today as we worship together. Um, it kind of feels like it's June so surely things should be getting quieter in the church but yet we seem to be as busy as ever which really is great. Um, this evening we're going to have a very special service in the life of our church uh, and we're, because we're going to be licensing Stephen McCleary. Uh, one of our own who is moving into the second stage of his ministry training uh, where he will become uh, what we term licensed but it's really releasing him now into be a full-time assistant uh, within Trinity Presbyterian in Balamoni. So we'll be holding that licensing service at our church here tonight and if you're able to come down uh, to that service it'll, it'll be great to have you there as we as a whole church seek to send him off within this next phase of his ministry training. Uh, in a couple of weeks time, I think it's on the 23rd, we are going to be having our family service. So we'll be celebrating some of our, our, our kids as they get like the Sunday school prizes. Uh, and we'll be looking to make that just a whole family service as well. So remember our children in your prayer lives as well at this time. Um, so even though we're half, well, we're, we're into the guts of June. Um, it's not the summer holidays yet. There's still plenty going on. Um, and regardless of what time of year it is, regardless of what time of day it is, we seek to come and continue to praise our, our Heavenly Father and our Lord. Uh, and so let's do that, but let's use Psalm 111 to bring us into that worship this morning. It says this, Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, in the company of the upright, in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them. Full of splendor and majesty is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Well, we find ourselves now in the company of the upright. They are gathered here online as part of this congregation. So let us praise and worship him now with our first hymn. Unending love, a 
amazing grace The Lord has promised good to me His word, my hope As life endures, my chains are gone. I've been set free. My God, my Savior has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns unending. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow The sun forbear to shine But God who called me here below Will be forever be forever you are forever our reading today is from the book of matthew we're going to read chapter 25 and we're going to pick it up at verse 14 and we're going to read through to verse 30. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 14. For it'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here I made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also who had two talents came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents, and here I made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also who had received the one talent came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So I was afraid and I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I have not, not sowed and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has been who, for to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, 
even what he has will be taken away from him and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Amen. We pray that God will teach us and lead us from his word today. I'm going to take some time to pray now. And just having seen uh, some of the footage of the um, D-Day landings and the remembrances uh, going on there, maybe today is a fitting day uh, to remember those who are in our armed services uh, and serving across the world. So let's bow our heads together this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you that all those years ago, 80 years ago, that those men and women were willing to put themselves in harm's way to bring to an end a tyrannical leader who for so many years had murdered and butchered and enslaved so many people. We thank you that men and women were willing to stand up and say no more and lay down their lives to free others. We remember that today, Father. There are still men and women who are standing in conflict, who are seeking to protect and look after others. We pray for our service men and women at home and across the world, all of those who are willing to serve their communities and their country. Father, we pray for their chaplains today as they seek to bring the gospel to them here in service and also to provide pastoral care and counselling for we recognise that it's not just damage to the body that these men and women stand uh, with the risk of, but also damage to the heart and mind. So we give our chaplains and our pastors skill as they work among our armed forces. And Father, we pray for those areas of the world that we continue to see conflict in. Ukraine, in the Middle East, in, in so many civil wars and strife within North Africa, Father. We pray for a resolution of these conflicts. We continue to pray that peace will reign, that people will move back from their pride and their greed, and that the everyday person can go back to work and rebuild their lives. Father, we see the footage of those D-Day landings, and we see the destruction of bomb and bullet. And we want no more of that, Father. So we continue to thank you for those who gave their lives to secure peace. And we continue to pray for peace in those countries that are in the middle of conflict at the minute. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So this morning we are going to consider a well-known parable. Uh, the issue that when we hear that, is that we can instantly sort of turn off uh, and we kind of think, uh, sure, I know it. Um, I don't need to think much about it now. I kind of know the general message underneath it. I can have a quick sort of 20 minute snooze uh, and put the end of the service in. Uh, and, and familiarity can breed contempt in this manner. It does it for all of us. But we also need to remember that this is God's living word that we're considering this morning. Uh, infused with his Holy Spirit and he can use the familiar to teach us something that we need to hear as well as something new that we need to hear. It is a parable that follows on from last week as we considered the, the marvellous vineyard, the parable of the vineyard, um, that the landowner he left in the hands of, of the tenants, the renters, but instead of giving the harvest back to the owner, uh, they become selfish, they become greedy, they want to keep it to themselves. Um, and they're meant to look after the vineyard uh, for the Lord or the master, but they abused that trust uh, and, uh, and didn't do what they were meant to do. They were meant to take responsibility for what they were given and then give the owner back his due of the harvest. Um, and in fact, rather than doing that, they, they beat up and, and killed uh, his servants. Uh, and then we see it kind of spiraling out of control where by the end that they have actually killed the owner's son. In this parable, today again we see a, a number of people being asked to steward something, to look after something that their boss entrusts to their care. 
Um, and from the beginning, we need to point out that almost this is the kind of opposite sort of um, parable to last week. Last week was really an allegory where, where every character and everything that happens within it uh, and every everything within the story means something. Uh, today, it's, it's, it's a much, uh, Jesus is seeking to paint a much simpler, um, broad picture. Um, so not everything means exactly what it looks like within the parable. Let's put it that way. Um, we even have a problem with the, with, with the title because it's called we, we have called it the parable of the ta- the the parable of the talents, uh, and because we label something, we've labeled it right. So that's about talents, uh, and in the misconception of what talents means, we we default to thinking that this uh, parable is about how we use our gifts and abilities to serve God, and there's a little bit of that within it. Um, but that's not what the talents refer to at all. And so we want to mine into that a little bit as well. Um, the the talents that it refers to within this parable are really actually talking about money. And it's talking about lots and lots of money. So in our passage today, in this, this parable of lots and lots of money, we again see a ruler, a leader, a boss, whatever, and he's three servants. And he gives to the each of them differing amounts of money. And what an amount of money he gives them. Uh, We see it called here or referred to in terms of talents. Now talents are a weight of currency. It could be gold or silver or tin or other things. uh, But it's a weight of currency. Commentators um, suggest that that a talent would be the equivalent to sort of what a standard labourer could hope to earn in, in half of his lifetime. I don't know how they come to that figure. But it comes up over and over again in different writing. Um, so we'll, if we kind of map that out a wee bit, if the average salary is about 20 grand um, and you've got a 40 year working life. So you're thinking your working life, you're going to make about 800,000. So half of that is 400,000. So each talent is about 400,000 pounds. And the first guy, he gets five talents. The next guy gets two talents. The last guy, the smallest guy, he gets, he gets one talent. So he, he's still getting 400,000 pounds these are not insignificant amounts of money where ability does come in uh, is when we read about that the the amounts of money are given to each of them according to their own abilities so the most gets given probably to the person who's that kind of the bit of a go-getter and 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 the next guy he's got a good head so he still gets a lot of money and the third guy is still getting four hundred thousand. so you've got to expect that he's probably seen as he's a steady hand as well and what happens next within the story makes makes all the difference. The boss, well, he goes away for a period. And what each of these people left behind do with the money, how they steward the money, how they look after it, what they do with the money um, in the interim time becomes really important. We read that the, the first guy and the second guy, they trade uh, with their money, so they kind of do business with it, and they double the amount of money they have. But the third guy, we read that he buries his. Now at first, that might seem odd. You're gonna take 400 grand out of your field and you're gonna bury it. That seems odd, but it wasn't an uncommon practice. Banks at this point were kind of reasonably new. Um, Some guys would talk about how they're sort of coming in with the Romans, but they're new, they're not fully trusted. they offered some interest, but also alongside that there was risk because they would invest your money. They would do with your money what these guys have already done with the master's money. Um, and so, yes, you could you could make some interest, but you could also lose your money. And also, it's a bit more of a... Um, I'm trying to think of it. It's not as secure in a bank as we would consider in our bank. So you could lose it to robbery or theft or something like that as well. So lots of people would if uh, would have regularly buried their treasure, their money, their their finance that they might have um, somewhere to keep it safe. So we see an example of that uh, in one of the other parables Jesus teaches where he talks about the parable of the buried treasure. You know, that was seen as fairly normal. So this guy finds himself suddenly with a lot of money and he thinks, well, the safest thing to do is to bury this and hide it away. So the ruler gives three guys great wealth. Two work their money and they make a profit. Um, One buries it and it achieves nothing. 
The boss returns and he is pleased as we read with the first two guys. But he's angry with the third. So what is it that the Jesus is wanting to teach us about in this parable? What is this treasure within the parable? What is it all about? Well, this parable sits uh, among a family of parables and stories um, that are coming up before the arrest of Jesus and his crucifixion. Uh, we see a task to be fulfilled. There's someone, uh, a ruler who puts others in charge or gives them responsibility. Uh, there is some form of arrival or return or uh, so we see in the parable of the vineyard, the parable of the talents here, this boss who returns in the, in the parable of the ten virgins, we see the bridegroom that arrives. Um, and, and these all point to what theologians like to talk about, uh, the, the parousia. And that's basically where we talk about the return of Christ, the second coming. Parousia just simply means arrival, the arrival of Jesus again. And in last week's parable, we saw the almost the whole story of Israel, but right through to the return. So we see the incarnation because the son is sent, but then the father returns and everything comes under his judgment. Um, and, and in this parable, you know, we see these themes. We see the people being given a task and carrying it out. And then we see the return of the Lord with each being responsible or having to give uh, an account of what they have done. Those who have served well, please the Lord, and those who have done nothing, will they displease the Lord. So let's think about this some more this morning. Firstly, we recognise that within this parable, we see that we have been given a task. And there is an expectation that we are going to see growth, or should see growth, in that task but what is that task for us today what is the task of the church um we see some of it in the great commission as we looked at last week go and make disciples we also see jesus constantly speaking about the kingdom of god and we see that here because in chapter five the first parable is the parable of the ten virgins and it starts with then the kingdom of heaven will be like and as we move into our passage, there's a linking phrase that kind of says, well, what we were talking about there in the parable of the ten virgins, we're continuing to talk about here in the parable of the talents. It says, for it will be like, and that refers back to the previous bit. So it's still talking about the kingdom of God. What will the kingdom of God be like? And part of our task that we have been given is to see Christ reign here uh, and see his kingdom grow in the here and the now. We considered this in the autumn when we thought through uh, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we looked at the sharing of the good news of Jesus with others and, and our desire to see them come into the kingdom of God. And by that, we mean that they then begin to live their lives under the headship of Christ, rather than the headship of themselves, the headship of others. It was an invitation to lifelong discipleship and following of Jesus uh, that grew the kingdom of God both numerically uh, but also influentially within our world we who had received the gift of the gospel ourselves have been tasked with giving that gospel away in order that we can see it multiply and grow within our world we read in second corinthians a lot the language of this uh, where it says that we carry this treasure in jars of clay so we're reading about treasure here in the parable of the talents that the guys have been given to look after. In 2 Corinthians, we read that we have been given treasure and we carry it in jars of clay. The jars of clay are us, these sort of imperfect vessels, if you will. And the treasure we read there is the gospel, is it, the, it's, it is the light of the darkness, it is the knowledge of the glory of God as revealed through Jesus Christ. And we, the jars of clay, we, we carry this gospel within us and we are to share it with the world. That is the task within this parable. We have been given this treasure of great value and we are called to see it multiply and grow in the lives of others. And when we understand that, then we fully understand the anger of the Lord who returns and discovers that instead of seeing this great treasure grow and
and spread and be shared. Rather, he discovers that it's been buried in the ground, unseen, unknown, unheard by anyone, hidden away from sight. I love even, um, remember even years ago, some guy was talking about this, you know, part of the image of the jars of clay was that jars of clay would be cracked and broken and they're imperfect and the lids don't fit right. You know, they're just a really bog standard everyday thing in the kitchen. But therefore, by that very nature, the light that was within them would be, would be shining out through those gaps and cracks and spaces and everything else. Um, and that's fine if you've got a jar of clay that's carrying the treasure, the light shines out of it. But when you bury it, that, that light, that treasure vanishes. It is unseen. It'll no longer shine. No one will know it's there. But is that not what our culture today wants of us, asks of us, in some cases demands of us? That's what it wants us to do with our faith today. It says, keep it to yourself. Keep it private. You shouldn't bother other people with your Christian faith. Yes, you have your faith, but look, bury it nice and deep so that others won't need to be bothered by it, offended by it, disturbed by it, or challenged by it. Keep it away. Keep it out of sight. But that is the very thing that the Lord here in this passage reels against. The third guy in his timidity, he hides the treasure away thinking that that will please the master. But rather than pleasing the master is what angers him. There's a clear warning to us, his church here today. The gospel is not to be hidden. We are not to play it safe. We see the others out there, they're trading, they're working, they're, they're making things happen. They're seeing their, the treasure they've been given grow and multiply and everything else. And there's something there that we're meant to be imitating. You know, trying things, taking chances, on occasions taking risks. But in all that, seeking to reveal and, and share the gospel with others. You know, theologian and, and commentator R.T. Franz writes of these verses. He says this, risk is at the heart of discipleship. By playing safely, the cautious slave has achieved nothing. And it's his timidity and lack of enterprise which is condemned. Schweitzer describes his attitude as representing a religion consumed or concerned only with, with not doing wrong. Preacher and writer Barclay states that in this parable, Jesus tells us there can be no religion or faith without adventure. And that God can find no use for that shut mind. In our sharing of the gospel, we're, we're, we're called to be dynamic and, we're, and, and to be willing to try different things in different cultures and different places. And we're certainly not going to take knockbacks as failures, you know, the only failure really here is, is, is not to do anything at all. And I've, I've spoken about it many times. Eugene Peterson spoke about watching the kingfisher diving for fish. And he wants to dive and catch nothing, dive and catch nothing, dive and catch nothing, dive and catch nothing, until eventually it caught a fish. And he reflected, this is the kingfisher. He is meant to be the best at catching fish. Yes, he gave him the title king, kingfisher. But he knows that he has to go over and over and over again. Otherwise, he'll starve. Otherwise, he'll be left without. So he brings his expertise and his patience to bear to the issue. And he fishes over and over and over again. He tries over and over and over again until he sees success. Until he sees growth. Like us with the gospel, we're meant to keep going, we're meant to keep sharing, we're meant to keep being creative, we're meant to keep committed to sharing the gospel into a reluctant world. Because the gospel is of such value. It is the world's greatest treasure. It is the only thing that can move us from death to life and transform us into who we were made to be. It is the ultimate act of selfishness to keep that gospel to ourselves. And we're each called to share the gospel how we can. We read in the passage that the most was entrusted to the most able. 
you know, what we're meant to read here is that we're called to share the gospel in different ways and by different means as we are gifted and through the characters that we have. It is, it is not to say that some can share it and some cannot share it. It's rather to say that we all share it in different ways because we're all made differently. Um, we look into the body of the church in Corinthians and talks about, you know, our ear or all an ear or all a nose or all a foot or all an eye. You know, and one can't say to the other, you're better than me, you're worse than me because you're different to me. Rather, all those things have to work together in order to see um, the church operate how it should, the gospel shared, the kingdom of God grow. Well, that, that's what this parable is for saying. You know, different people will do things in different ways. And some will, you know, Billy Graham will see incredible growth through mission. Um, somebody else will see it very, very differently. But all of us are called to serve. You know, the introvert will share differently from the extrovert. The academic will, will, will share differently from the, from the electrician. The preacher will share differently from the teacher. But all of our individual gifts, talents and abilities are to be used within the church. And the central work of the church is to share the gospel with the world. No one, no one has permission to bury the gospel in their lives. There is no follower of Jesus who is exempt. As we see at the end, the thing that earns the Lord's displeasure is the life of hidden treasure. Who wants to be the third guy? Who wants to be the one who hides the greatest treasure in the world? I've been to the Tower of London uh, and they're the world's greatest treasures. They're all on show for everybody to see and people are queuing up around the block to come in and be wowed and awed by the incredible treasure in front of them. Just to get a glimpse of it. They are displayed proudly in all their glory. How much more should we be sharing proudly with, with everybody we meet the treasure that is the gospel? Who do you want to be? The first two guys the Lord invites into his presence were the terrified of failure third guys cast out. What makes the difference? Letting the light of Jesus shine out of these jars of clay. That's what makes the difference. You know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Amen. When I survey
as we leave this place now, may you do so knowing the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and always. Amen.